Barrel Joe Parr is a prisoner. If Texas has its way, he'll be dead within the hour. This is Execution Watch. Huntsville, Texas, death penalty capital of the Western world, where prison workers are getting ready to execute Parr by injecting him with a deliberate drug overdose. During the next hour, KPFT's Execution Watch will provide live coverage and commentary on the killing in Texas, which carries out more than a third of all executions in the U.S. Parr's execution will be the 497th in Texas during the modern era a record no other state comes close to matching. Execution host Ray Hill, legal analyst Jim Skelton, with criminal defense attorneys Susan Ashley, Larry Douglas, Mike Gillespie, and Jack Lee. Huntsville report outside the death house Dr. Dennis Longmire, Houston vigil reporter Jennifer Simmons. Our feature interview is pre-recorded, of necessity. It's with Parr, who spoke to Execution Watch last week on death row. The execution watch for Carol Jill Parr begins. This is Ray Hill. I am the host of Execution Watch. We're under a little stress this evening because we have changed studios twice in the last few minutes and we're broadcasting on the HD3 channel rather than on the broadcast channel because it is fundraising time at radio station KPFT and the folks who do Nuestra Palombra are busily trying to raise money for the station. Please keep that in mind that KPFT is a non-commercial listener-sponsored radio station that needs and deserves your support because we're in the business of doing radio that nobody else will touch, up to and including Execution Watch. Carol Joe Parr uh, was interviewed by me last Wednesday, and right now he is uh, being scheduled uh, to die. Uh, our producer, Elizabeth Stein, is in another room getting incoming phone calls, which we technically cannot do here. Uh, but the fact of the matter is uh, we're waiting for word from Huntsville uh, that the witnesses have crossed the road. That means the process has begun and it will not be stopped until the deed is done and he is dead. That's the way executions happen in Texas. Uh, while we were there last Wednesday, we also interviewed uh, Pruitt, who is scheduled on the 21st. When we do a live interview with the inmate that is being executed, the program is videotaped by Mark Pirtle, who is a technical fellow from... Uh, the Houston Media Source, and uh, it will be broadcast at a later date on Houston Media Source. If you're networked in to our Facebook or our webpage, we will put notice up of when this uh, show will be uh, broadcast, and you will get to see the video of not only our doing this show, but also the interview uh, with uh, Carol Joe Parr. Jim? What happened in this case? Well, let me explain. Uh, Carol Joe Parr was t about 25 years old, and he and a guy named Earl Whiteside. They were buying some marijuana from a couple of kids. One of them was both of them were 18 years old, a kid named Joel Dominguez and a kid named Mario Chavez. And during the buying of the, uh, after the sale was made, apparently Carol Joe Parr didn't want to leave any witnesses and decided to rob them. So he pistol whipped both boys, and at this time what happened is that he in turn shot, uh, sh he shot Mario, shot Joel Dominguez, and he more or less instructed Whiteside to shoot the other kid, Mario Chavez. Chavez li lived, and Dominguez died. And it was basically a drug deal going bad in which they robbed two people during a trial, during the drug robbery. And the way they made the case was pretty simple. Uh, Whiteside worked a deal with the state, testified for the state. The man who survived the killing, a man by the name of Mario Chavez, identified Carol Parr as being the shooter. And plus, he confessed to everybody but Dear Abby. He told cellmates, told girlfriends, and all of them came in and testified that he confessed to them. Although at trial, he claimed that somebody else did the shooting that he didn't. So guilt was pretty well assured because they had the one surviving witness identified him, co-defendant identified him, and at least three other people, cellmates, ex-girlfriends, and ex-friends that he talked to the murderer about 
came in and testified against him, so guilt was pretty well certain. The only issue was really punishment. So there was no uh, big uh, uh, issue of uh, on the guilt or innocence? None, uh, 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 None whatsoever. Uh, was there anything else to present at this trial at all, mitigating circumstances? It was primarily a punishment case, and I've asked Susan Ashley to go over all the punishment evidence, and she'll pretty well explain that to you. What the state shows at punishment really is an escalating pattern of lawlessness, okay? There are a couple of adjudicated offenses. Uh, the adjudicated offenses are that he was arrested and placed on probation for three counts of delivery of cocaine. Two, that was in 1996. About two years later, in 1998, his probation was revoked, and he got two years state jail time. Uh, there was also a, a resisting or um, evading arrest, resisting arrest, evading arrest, and a possession of marijuana. However, the main problem really was not the adjudicated offenses. It was, the un it was an unadjudicated shooting, an unadjudicated murder. That was really the main problem that came out at punishment. Um, there was a man that uh, that I guess he said he shot and killed and this man the reason the motivation for him shooting the man was this man was supposed to testify against a friend of his at a trial in a prosecution so he shot this person and then he later took his co-defendant Mr. W in, in this case he took his co-defendant Mr. Whiteside to where he had dumped the body. He told Whiteside about the shooting, and he took Whiteside to where he had the body. Similarly, with his girlfriend, he told her about it, and he took her to where the shooting took place. Susan, hold there. Let me go to Huntsville. Dennis, are you there? Yes, I am, Ray. I'm sorry for the delay. No, we're having technical problems down here, and that's difficult. So what's happening in Huntsville? Well, the witnesses for the media, and then immediately following them, the witnesses for um, for Carol have entered the Walls unit. And so, as you know, that is the signal that the execution is going forward untethered. The process, the process has begun and probably will not stop till it's over. Uh, are there vigilants there? There are. There are six of us. Five, six of us, um, actually probably seven or eight of us. A couple of people are seeking shelter from the sun in, the, in their cars, but about six or so, eight people here on the corner, uh, quietly protesting. Gloria, is, who is Rubeck, is normally here with her megaphone, and she's not here. Her presence is missed. Yeah, well, Gloria, Gloria's presence is always noticed. Frequently missed, she is uh, a meeting of her organization tonight. That's correct. And, and so while I miss her spirit here, I certainly do not miss the megaphone. I, um, um, but that's my own personal <laughs> position. I respect Gloria. I, actually, done. I think Gloria was born with a megaphone. Uh, uh, <laughs> at least as long as I've known her, she's had one in her face. I am talking to Professor Dennis Long. Uh, it's doctor now, isn't it? Dr. Longmire, yes. Uh, Dr. Longmire, who is uh, an instructor of criminal justice at uh, Sam Houston State University. And, uh, uh, Dennis, we really appreciate uh, uh, your, uh, uh, your being on the air with us. And give our regards to the other vigilants. I certainly will. I will let you know that David Atwood is here, not where he is supposed to he is supposed to be. He is up here right beside me, and so we'll give him uh, give him our love and regards. Put him on if he's got something to say about this case. Here he is. Hi, is this Ray? Hey, Ray. Well, uh, I don't really like this spot very well. Uh, I wish you, but you've been arrested on. there. What do you mean? Well, <laughs> yeah, but that's not the reason I don't like it. It's just that. Uh, Many of us, especially Dennis, have been here way, and Gloria, too, have been here way too many times. And, uh, you know, we wish this whole thing would stop the sooner the better, and we could do something else with our life. But while the executions go on, uh, we're going to stay in vigil, and uh, that's what we're doing. 
I, uh, Charlie Sullivan was in Houston this weekend, or uh, today, as a matter of fact, I did a meeting with him that was televised. You'll have to catch that on the rerun. Uh, uh, but uh, we talked about the death penalty and your vigilance on that issue, and I want you to know that's appreciated. How do people yeah. find your organization? Uh, they find uh, our organization, uh, the website is tcadp.org, O-R-G, tcadp.org. TCADP is an acronym for uh, Texas Coalition uh, Against the Death Penalty. Right, right. And do those letters, plots.org, and you'll find them every time. Thank you very much. Um, okay. We appreciate it. Here's Dennis again. Okay. All righty. Thanks, Ray. Dennis, get back in touch with us if something happens. Get back in touch with Elizabeth. I will, Ray. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. And uh, there is a vigil going on here in Houston. Uh, and Jennifer Simmons is participating in that vigil, and I suppose we will hear from them in a few minutes. But, Susan, I'm sorry about the interruption of the punishment phase. Uh, uh, but it was pretty much cut and dried, was it? Well, the, the non-adjudicated previous shooting. That probably is the most damaging testimony evidence that comes in at the punishment phase, uh, that he showed— white side where he had dumped the told white side about it showed white side where he dumped the body took him to the place and the same thing w with the girlfriend also his reasoning for the that killing was that that person was going to testify against a friend of his and that was his motivation for that killing and so the and he expressed no, clearly no remorse and other witnesses also stated testified that he expressed no remorse whose testimony brought that into this trial well, white side white side white, white side would probably be the most damaging testimony and of course the girlfriend's testimony was was also damaging and there were other witnesses he also talked to and he expressed no remorse for the killing he also apparently was angry at Whiteside that Whiteside did not kill the other victim, Chavez, because he was angry that there was one victim left to testify, that he did not want Mercy. another you know, live yeah. witness to be available. Okay. Um, uh, we've got uh, Jennifer Simmons on there. Jennifer, is that you? I am here, Ray. And where is here? Well, here is at the corner of Maine and Benz in downtown Houston, uh, one of the busiest, nicest uh, intersections in the city. And right across from the Museum of Fine Arts? Museum, museums, uh, Hotel Zaza, the big churches. We get lots of uh, traffic, foot traffic, vehicular traffic. It's a very good place. For um, us to hold our vigil. How many uh, vigilants are there in your company? Well, we have 10 today, some I haven't seen before, which is always good. And we range in age from about 90 down to about 30. So we have a cross section of people. And this vigil happens every time there is an execution? Yes, in every, Texas. Every, every time. We, we believe that everyone who is executed deserves. A vigil. Um, it's a really good opportunity for us to outreach with the public who is just passing by, so busy with their own lives. They look up and they see us, and many people are just in shock. What are you guys doing here? It is so incompatible with their routine and what they're thinking of at the time. Um, and so many people stop and talk to us. We get positive reactions or usually neutral reactions, but uh, I think it's a very good way to outreach the public. Well, I thank you very much for calling in, Jennifer. The witnesses have crossed the road in Huntsville. Okay. So the process has begun, and we do not anticipate uh, it being over till it's over. Okay. However, however, uh, uh, we want you to give our regards to the other vigilants. Yes. And I need to tell people that uh, this demonstration is coordinated by the Texas Coalition Against the Death Penalty. Right. And the and website is www.tcadp.com. Yes, yes, that's, that's correct. Thank and you. We're on, and we're on Facebook, too, if they like to browse through there. Okay. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Ray. Bye-bye. 
Uh, so we go to trial. Uh, you have people testifying, <laughs> including co-defendants. Testifying against it with like material evidence. Jim, you got in? Yeah, and I was going to ask Mike Gillespie to give the evidence from the defense side. There was a good deal of mitigating evidence. I want to ask Mike to discuss Okay. That. This is Attorney Mike. Well, everybody you hear on the other microphone, that's Jim and that's Susan, and now it's Mike Gillespie, our attorneys. Uh, uh, Jim does a lot of consulting work. Uh, the other attorneys are actually out there in the trenches uh, hoofing it and... Uh, 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 trying to protect clients. Mike, welcome on. Go ahead. Th thank you very much. Um, the death, closer to the mic, please. The death penalty is the most severe punishment we have in the state of Texas. It calls for a man's life. Because of the severeness of it, there's a special s series of hurdles the prosecution must go over in order to achieve the death penalty. These hurdles are const constitutional protections that protects the defendant from being executed. The issue that the defense brought up was they thought that these jury instructions that are given to the jury to make these decisions was unconstitutional because they did not give the jury the de proper definitions to understand the mitigating circumstances. The problem with mitigating circumstances is when we think as civilians of mitigating circumstances, we think of in high school when we tell the teacher the dog gave my homework. It's a mitigation of why I didn't do it. The trouble with the, the law is that in most of these cases, the history of the men who were put up to death row, their lives have such horrible facts that sometimes these facts can turn the jury. What the courts are trying to do is make independent determinations of whether or not this person is a continuous threat to society through special issues rather than facts. Mm -hmm. The concept is you avoid the facts and talk about the result of it. And what they do in Texas, in order to achieve the death penalty in Texas, the state needs to prove beyond a reasonable doubt three questions and then a fourth question. And the first question they got to determine to the jury is that if the conduct of the defendant that caused the death of the deceased was committed deliberately with the reasonable expectation that the death of another would result. Clearly, the person would have to know that what he did was cause the death and he knew what he was doing and he was aware of it. Number one test. The second test is that in spite of that act, they still have to prove that that was not an isolated incident that this person could do this again the future threat to society. Then the third test they have to find out is that if the deceased did not do something to provoke the defendant. So these are three very important questions. These questions have to be answered unanimously, all, all 12 people saying yes, 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 that he knew what he was doing, he caused the death, that he's a future danger to society, and that the, defend, the deceased did not do something to provoke him. If all three of these come back yes, and they have to come back yes, then they get to face the last question, and the last question has supposed to got to do with the mitigating circumstances. <clears throat> Take into effect all of the circumstances of the offense, the defendant's character and background, his personal mo moral culpability, is there sufficient mitigating circumstances to warrant that the sentence of life imprisonment within death should be imposed? That question, they got to come back and find no. The problem with that question is that question is more properly stress not by showing things the man did in the pa in the past that show different personality quirks or facts but is better off shown by showing acts of kindness that he's done more showing that his life results in a person who is not a violent person acts of kindness and then expert testimony to show how that person could be re rehabilitated and these acts are not likely to come again this is a very difficult burden to meet and especially burden when in order to meet that burden the defense attorney has got to expose his client's life and the trouble of a man like this this is a man whose mother was pregnant at eight, was a drug addict at 11, who has a track record of violent crimes against society and hurting people, by showing the jury these mitigating circumstances of his tough life, you can have the jury turn your back on him and figure that he cannot be redeemed, cannot be, be, be fixed. So the law tries to make it a neutral by not showing the facts of his life, but by showing that in spite of that, he has still done some random acts of kindness. He has still done some things to show that he can be saved. And so the, the way you handle it is not to show mitigating circumstances in the past, but to show how in the future he could be a different person and not commit these acts again. 
And the jury bought none of that. They bought none of that. And uh, which happens all too frequently in these kind of cases. It happens all too frequently, but I understand it's happening more and more now. Uh, maybe the result of this show, maybe the result of the amount of executions that people are getting to understand that this is not something that you do in every case. Thank you, Jack. Was there anything in the appellate process that uh, brought stuff to light that uh, we should be aware of? Yeah, Larry's going to discuss this. It's real interesting in this paper before Larry gets a seat over here. What's really interesting in this case, he did something very unique. He tried, number one, fire his lawyers, and then he wanted to withdraw most of the appeals. And Larry's going to discuss that. Well, clearly, uh, a person who is accused of a crime has a right to counsel. Uh, well, well, first of all, a person has a right to a trial by jury. But at least for the past 50 years, it's since uh, 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 Gideon versus Wainwright, it, it's been determined that the, the right to counsel, the right to a trial, the right to, to, to a trial by jury is not really worth anything unless you have, have a competent counsel uh, to advise you. That right to counsel get goes with the right to a trial and the other rights. Now, the right to counsel is not the obligation to counsel. It's the right to counsel. So you can reject counsel and represent yourself. You've got a right to do that. It's not, not a wise thing to do. And if you try to do that, most judges will try to keep you from doing that because they, they don't want to have uh, just They have the, to do the that mockery. trial again. Yeah, absolutely. And then the judges don't want, don't, don't want to have cases to come back on them. Uh, in this case, what he sought to, to do was actually to fire his counsel, not at trial, but at the very end of the appellate process. Okay, that, that is, uh, he, he was already headed to the, to the death chamber. Uh, and, and the lawyer who was appointed to him, uh, he sought to fire that lawyer. It's not one of those deals where you had the same lawyer doing three, wearing three hats. Absolutely not. Okay. No, 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 no not, not at all. We're talking about a different lawyer from trial lawyer. Correct. Correct, to, to, to handle the appeal and ha handle the habeas uh, matters for him. Uh, now, a lawyer, no matter what phase of the lawsuit you, you, you're handling, uh, this obligation is to zealously represent the client. So in this case, as, as, as it should happen, uh, when the client said he wanted to fire the lawyer, one, the lawyer, so long as the lawyer is the lawyer, has to continue to represent the client to the best of his ability but also try to um, uh, carry out the client's wishes. So what this lawyer did was filed a motion to withdraw as counsel. Uh, and so, but the judge rejected that motion because the judge says, well, it, it wouldn't make a lot of sense for us to, at, at this late state, to allow him to withdraw uh, because then we'd have to appoint another lawyer who could not, uh, would not have the time to get up to speed necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so the judge rejected, but, but the lawyer, to his credit, did follow the client's advice, or follow, f try to go along with the client's wishes, and that is to at least file a motion to withdraw. So the lawyer filed the motion to withdraw, but at the same time, simultaneously, the lawyer continued to represent the client to the best of his ability. Now, now a lot of times, th this whole issue of appointed counsel, um, uh, because the, 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 the whole issue of appointed counsel as, as compared to paid counsel all along the, uh, the criminal justice system, people are somewhat, defendants are oftentimes suspicious of a person that I'm not paying. Um, I was sharing with, 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 with Jim earlier that you know, I've even had clients who, who, who've told me that they want to fire you if you are appointed to represent you. And one of the craziest one <laughs> that, that I ever had was a guy who says, I want to fire you as my appointed lawyer, but once I, you're no longer appointed, now I want to hire you. Okay. Because if you are is, hired, you'll do a better job. Is there any indication in the record that at any point along here, Carol Parr received less than competent representation? I, I am not aware that there there is any legitimate claim that he, his representation was not, not adequate. We're picking to hear from Carol Parr about that. Uh, Carol Parr was pre-recorded interview. We gave Execution Watch a 20-minute interview six days before today. If Texas puts Parr to death, and we expect that that process is continuing until it's over, we will broadcast his interview unedited, hasn't been a word change. The video of that interview will later show on Houston Media Source. This is Carol 
Joe Parr. My name is Carl Paul. Carl, you're on death row. Yes. Uh, I told you when we started our conversation to get ready for this that I wanted to hear from you and what yes. you want to talk about. Yes. So why I don't gonna, I just get out of the way? I was going to give you one question at least before I just take over. And yeah, go. why don't I just get out of the way and let you take over? Okay, well, me taking over, then, you know, I'm not against the death penalty, first of all. Okay. But I am against the way the death penalty is carried out, the way that these prosecutors be using it to better their careers and things like that with no repercussions, even after they caught wrongdoing, breaking the law, breaking the Constitution, all these type of things right here. You know, taking into consideration that I was being framed from the beginning of my incarceration with a phone conversation that happened from a 1997 murder was used in a 2003 murder case to get me indicted. My attorneys won't bring it up. Even my attorney at the time, who is now Abel Al Abelino, Abel Rayner, the head DA, he even noticed. He even told me himself, they fucked up your grand jury hearing. Don't tell nobody I told you this, but don't ever forget it either. My attorneys won't bring this up either. You know, all through my appeals, I try to bring up things in my state habits. My attorneys won't bring that up. I write to the Supreme Court, all the way down to Attorney General's office. They won't bring that up. I can't get no assistance. So the ineffective assistance counsel that we're receiving during our appeals here on Texas Death Row is what I'm against. I'm not against the death penalty. I'll say that again. I'm against the way that we are being given these uncompetent, should I say uncompetent? No, I don't think uncompetent is the proper word because they competent that they just ineffective. You know, it's, if it's if it's benefiting them, they're getting paid, then they'll do what they're supposed to do. But if it's not, they ain't getting no pay. They ain't trying to do nothing. You know, it's like I was telling you a while ago. When I went back on my execution to get my execution date set, the law say we are entitled to counsel. From the beginning of our appeals, federal appeals, to the end, all the way to clemency. Okay, they had a, they held an actual adversary proceeding when they took me back to my to my county to get my execution date. The judge asked me, "Is there any reason you feel you shouldn't be executed?" My words to him was, "Where my attorney at?" And then the second words was, "The Abel Abilene Rainer will tell you what happened in my grand jury hearing." I'm sure that the judge know because the judge was a part of his law firm at the time. There was partners in the law firm at the time, but now he's a judge. I believe Rainey is a head DA. He said that holds no legal significance. Okay, if if you want, if in order for it to hold legal significance, then you mean you want if whatever my reasons for, whatever my reasons for telling you that I shouldn't be executed, you wanted to be presented to you in a legal format. Well, my attorney should have been there to do that. My attorney wasn't there. So I would deny counsel. I wrote the judge about that. They ain't trying to hear that. But the law, Constitution, the Sixth Amendment say that we are entitled to counsel. No prisoner that's facing death should be forced to make a critical decision at no time. Okay, that was a critical decision right there. You asked me, is there any reason I feel I shouldn't be executed? And I gave you a reason. You said it holds no legal significance. Well, my attorney wasn't there to present it to you in a legal format. You know, outside of that, you know, my federal appeals attorney, he didn't even look into my state habeas claims. You know, I wrote him, look, I try to file a motion uh desire to raise additional claims in state habeas. Well, I'm telling him, look, go get this motion. File what you're going to file out of that. Everything in there about this bailiff. File file that. File the ineffective assistance counsel. Put all this in my federal habeas because I tried to preserve this in state court because my attorney, after I told him I didn't do nothing, I didn't do the murder, he should have stood up and walked out. Boom, he gone. I wrote the judge about that. They didn't do nothing about that. Didn't even take him on my case. So my federal attorney, he wouldn't put none of these things in there. I done wrote to the Supreme Court. I done wrote everybody, trying to get them before the Supreme Court say, well, this ain't the court you need to address it to. So who do I address it to? I can't get my attorneys. I don't know how to file nothing. I can't get my attorneys to file it in the state court. I can't get the sister from the judge, the federal judge in the county, Walter Smith. I think his name Walter Smith. Or, or Matt Johnson, I can't get no assistance from them when I'm writing them with these concerns. I had a bailiff who was a state's witness. He testified. He handled me doing my jury. He handled me doing my trial and my jury doing my trial. And he testified in your case. And he testified in my case. Conflict of interest. I can't get nobody to bring that up. 
I got these new attorney, David Dial and, you know, a uh, uh, Jeffrey, Jeffrey L. Newberry. I bring this to their attention, you know. You know, Jeffrey was saying, oh, that's attorney thing, this uh, a belly thing, that's the best thing going. Okay, well, then once he found out about my co-defendant want to write a statement, he forgot all about that. You know, my, 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 my co-defendant ain't, you know, you know the courts will say this harm is error quickly. Co-defendant just going back on their word, you know, but. Yeah. This belly thing, come on, man. This altered, this altered videotape they use, they ain't trying to bring none of these. I, I got, a, I got a, a list of things. Videotape of what was altered? Of the store. It showed my co-defendant Earl Whiteside coming in the store before me because the lady, her name is in here. I think it's Elaine something. Yeah. Her name is Elaine something. I can't remember. She recorded it was Korean time, so when she went back, she got the end. She got, I mean, I can't remember the name of something, some, Elaine something, right? But she got the end of the tape. So she got my co defendant that came in the store last. But when she went back, she just started recording from there. When she found me and my other co defendant on there, she just started recording from there on. So the first thing you see, is my co-defendant that came in the store last, first. Then you see me and my other co-defendant. Well, that ain't how it played out. But my attorney let it play out like that. I told him doing trial, man, this, that ain't the way the tape's supposed to be. Well, that's the only tape we got. Nah, that ain't the only, get to, go get the original tape. Don't you still, can you still, get, man, there's a whole lot of different things in my case. That I try to write to Brad Levinson. He brushed me out to uh, David Dynell. Can't get no assistance. So again, I'm not against the death penalty. I ain't trying to stall just to live. I don't give a damn about life, you know. I believe in reincarnation. When I exit, when these eyes close, I'm exit the wound again. So I ain't tripping on death. It's just the fact that I didn't receive a fair trial. I ain't received no fair appeals because I got all these Waco attorneys that's not gonna go against Waco. I had uh, Turned out of uh, Grand Rio, I can't think of his name. Can't think of his name. He wanted to get on my case. Don Verne. Okay. He wanted to take my case. Psh, they went through three other Waco attorneys before they gave me another Waco attorney. This dude didn't send his credentials and everything. He said, I'll take his case if y'all appoint me. They wouldn't give them to me because they know he was going to put, he going to file that Waco attorneys wasn't going to file. How long have you been on the road? I Man, since 2004. Okay, and so you talked to a lot of guys on the road. Talked to a lot of guys on the road. Had a lot of guys here. How me many guys things. on the road got the same concerns about the quality of representation? Everybody here? on death row. Everybody on death row, and it's kind of sad the way that you know when guys like even myself write to the Supreme Court, we going to the highest people that it is, and with these concerns, and they look like well, okay, if they they should be take take it up on themselves. Look, if this mother. We got this in no, this case. You, you got to watch the language. Okay. Okay. That, that, that's I, I that's broadcast. I can bleep that out, but let's don't okay. give me too much well, to bleep out. Well, the Supreme Court, when, when they get letters like the letter I just sent to them last, they should look at that and say, look, if this person got this, if Mr. Park got this in this case, we finna get on the lower court side. They finna have to do something about this. We ain't just finna kill this man just because his attorney didn't file this. And he been tra he's showing us paperwork where he been trying to get this stuff in, and his attorney still won't do it. They ain't taking it up on their cell. They said, well, you got to go to the lower court. That's what they tell me in that letter they wrote back. They got it this morning. You got to go to the lower courts and address it with them. This ain't the proper court. I understand that, but I done went to the lower courts already. Where do I turn now? Okay, you've completed your direct appeals. I have completed my direct appeal, state then habeas. you had your state habeas. Where I, where I filed a, a desire to raise additional claims. The claims of my attorney wouldn't put in there. Okay, but it's in that record. It's in the record, yes. And he, my federal attorney could have brought it up because I filed it. He could have brought it up. He didn't want to do it because he ain't going to go against Waco, period. Just like I'm telling you, it's fingerprints on the shell cases. He won't get DNA tested on that. He won't go look at the grand jury testimony and see why the head DA, Abel, Abelina Reno, Abelina Reno, told me back then. They up in your grand jury hearing. Don't tell nobody I told you this, but don't never forget it either. He keep telling me he can't go get the grand jury testimony. He keep telling me he can't go investigate. He can't go relook at the tape, the off the videotape. 
And then when I he write me and say contact me with any questions, then when I write him, he don't even write back. Not even with the truth. And where is he now? Oh, uh, he in Waco, Texas. And he's a prosecutor now? Well, Abilene Arano is the prosecutor. That's the dude that told me they fucked up your grand jury. Don't tell nobody I told you about this, but don't never forget it either. He's a head prosecutor now. He's a head prosecutor. Yeah, my attorney. These was... people just change the chairs. You say what? These people just changing chairs. Yeah, they just changing chairs. That's how they do it down there. <laughs> they feed the hound, take care of the hound. And you don't think McClendon County is that significantly different from most other counties in Texas? Well, no, nah, they all the same. They all the same. It's just probably a little bit more severe down there. <laughs> well, everything. Even the water's a little stronger in Waco. <laughs> yeah, I heard. <laughs> I hear that from everybody. What's home for you? What's home? Yeah. Mark, doing? Texas, and Where? Waco. Mark, Texas, and Waco. You know, I'm kind of like a drifter. Okay. Yeah. You got family? I got kids. Other than that, my brother, Jimmy Paul, rest. I don't got no family. You close to your family visits? No. Nah. Nah, I don't be getting no visits. We ain't we on two different levels, two you're different psychological this, levels. You're gonna go through this alone? Well, I wouldn't go allow them to come up there, but my daughter wanna come, so I may let my daughter come. I may see You get her. to decide that, don't you? Yeah, I don't. Mm -hmm. I donate my body to the state since they don't want to give it to St. Jude. I try to donate it to St. Jude, you know. My my devil wanna say I'll be put to death with uh uh, some chemicals. They don't say what chemicals. Kill no, they, no, no. Texas, Texas is playing that pretty close to the heart. Okay. We've been raising that issue. Okay, well, kill me with anything. As yeah. long as you don't mess up my organs and donate my organs to St. Jude. Please, <laughs> somebody be able to use it. I think they're using our organs anyway, selling us. Killing us with anything. They don't have any trouble using organs in China. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're killing us with anything anyway, selling our organs over there in China somewhere else or somewhere. So you're ready for this spiritually? Huh? You ready for this spirit? Nah, I'm straight. They can't kill me. They can't kill what they can't create. And you, I, I heard that somebody else said that before, before Mr. Pruitt. He told me that, but I ain't never heard nobody I'm say that. I'm going to interview him next. So. Yeah, but they can't kill what they can't create. You're wrong. Um, you told these folks what you want to tell them? I am a light that cannot be shattered. I know no truth to being this man-made thing called death. It does not affect me, it said. I am the darkness, I am the light, I'm the night, I'm the day, I'm the light that can't be shadowed. So I ain't doing no tripping, bring it on. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Parr, appreciate you were, your interview. You're welcome. How you doing, Mr. Rainer? <laughs> Thank right, you, man. sir. You're welcome, man. Okay. Hey, hey, hold up. Are you yeah. still on? I'm still on. Okay, well, y'all look for my, uh, my my poetry book coming out, The Emotions of a Dying Man okay. and The Emotions of a Dying Breed. And Through My Eyes, my art book coming out, my daughter, Brie Asia Paul, be uh, publishing She's going to publish it? Yes, Through My She's Eyes. She's going to publish both of those things? Three things. Okay. Write Emot her. Write her. Tell her to get in touch with Execution Watch Yes. at KPFT in Houston. And we'll not only get it, we'll see to it and get some coverage in the media. All right, I will sure appreciate that. I got original art. Some of, some of that, uh, uh, what's the name, uh, Osha okay. type of art. You know anything about his art? No. Oh, okay, well, they, everybody I show it to, they say it's no, psychological. I'm a, I'm, I'm a sound guy, I'm not an art guy. Oh, they say it's a psycho, <laughs> they say it's psychological tests. Good. Okay, well, I appreciate y'all, man, giving me this interview, Appreciate man. you, appreciate right. you talking. <laughs> I, I wish I would have had longer. I could have articulate, articulated a little bit better. And that was um, the interview with Carol Joe Parr. We're going to take it out of Air Machine and slip it next door so that they can play it on uh, uh, Nuestra Palabra, now in progress. And uh, I, uh, I want to... Uh, are you doing all right, Mark? Yeah. Okay, I want to... Uh, Point out that that interview was done last Wednesday, and uh, Dennis. Dennis. Sorry, this is Dennis. Um, the execution has ended. It ended about four minutes ago. All of the witnesses came out, and I have just seen several of the witnesses for Mr. Parr uh, getting in their vehicle, and they must be heading toward the funeral home to be able to visit his body. And I don't know exactly what the plans are, but. Um, well, I can I can tell you that ritual because Carnes, who has the contract to pick up those bodies, 
has rented a small Baptist church not far from the prison itself. As the witnesses came out the front of the prison to cross the road from whence they came and disperse, the body went out the back gate of the prison in a van, and it's been taken to a small church. Nothing has been done to the body except it's covered with a sheet, and there the family will be able to touch the body while it is still warm. I know that's gruesome and gory, but the fact of the matter is anyone who cared about Carol Joe Parr for the entire time he was on death row have not been able to touch him. And now this is the only opportunity they touch him before the body is prepared for burial. And Dennis, you are, you are absolutely correct about all of that. Dennis, I appreciate your stamina and I admire your, um, your loyalty to the cause. Well, I feel the same about you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dennis. Okay, goodbye. Bye-bye. And that is the uh, sad duty of Dennis Longmire, and I continue my sad duty uh, of finishing a program. Mr. Uh, Parr is dead. And, Jim, you had some comments. Yeah, there's one thing that we see in these cases over and over again. I've asked Jack Lee to discuss it, and that's the fact that a co-defendant agrees with the state to testify against his fellow defendant. In this mm -hmm. particular case, Whiteside agreed to testify against Parr. And then we have that thing we see so often that somebody that was his cellmate comes forward and testifies against him at trial. We see this over and over again. And I've asked Jack Lee to discuss that aspect of the co-defendant testifying against somebody getting a better deal out of it. And I asked Jack to also discuss the fact how to handle it when a jail cellmate or a person in jail with you comes forward to work to deal with the state to testify for the state. Okay, Jack, what's cooking? Well, in this case, you had uh, white. Uh, Whiteside testified against Parr. Now, Whiteside had a previous conviction back in 19, uh, 1993, if I believe, that in uh, 1993 he was convicted of a cocaine uh, of a cocaine possession and got 10 years in TDC. On this case, uh, whereas whereas Parr was given uh, whereas Parr was convicted of murder and given life. Whiteside, on the other hand, was able uh, was offered uh, a reduction down to aggravated robbery and given 15 years, and that, and that was part of his that was part of his um, ha part of his deal. It was I, a let's make a deal thing. Oh sure, of of course it is. Now what they decided to do, <clears throat> I think there there are two ways you can attack um, attack the uh, testimony of the co-defendant. First of all, you can talk about that legally. It's just simply not fair. They're both committing the same crime. They are both in commission of similar uh, of of the same crime and very similar acts in commission of that uh, of that uh, of that scheme why is it that one gets murder and the possi and the very real possibility of death whereas the other one gets re gets it reduced down to an aggravated robbery and is and is given 15 years and that leads you to leads you to think about the prosecution when they and when they cut a deal with somebody they effectively know what the um, you know, uh, these are callous terms, but market value mm -hmm. of what the of what the punishment should be, and it, the market value the prosecution decided was 15 years. Now, admit it, you know, ad admittedly, you, the prosecution did not need Whiteside in order to uh, prosecute this case. They had a bunch of a bunch of other people. He talked to his girlfriend, told cellmates, told other people about uh, about. Uh, about the murder, they really didn't. Need, and you also had a corroborating witness of the uh, of the person who wasn't killed in the uh, in the crime. So you had they didn't actually need Whiteside, but it. it uh, I'm not real sure why the prosecution decided to uh, to bring him in, other than. Um, well, no, actually, I, I don't know why they why they brought him. Is in. it within the range of prosecutorial discretion? Sure, of course it is. the The prosecutors could uh, can do what they uh, what they what they'd like. I mean, frankly, if they really wanted to, they could have dismissed the uh, case against uh, against Whiteside. But I think the other way you could attack uh, the testimony of Whiteside is on on a fairness issue. If if they knew um, 
if they knew that why if they knew that they were going to give Whiteside uh, 15 years, and they actually told Whiteside that they were giving him 15 years, then the state really, um, if the state had disclosed it, this this is a, this is. This could have been brought up, could have been brought up to the jury and explained to them. Could the well, defense bring that in? Sure, the state could have brought that in, and the state might have argued. Well, the prosecution. No, you keep telling me that the state could have brought it in. I'm worried I'm sorry, about the my defense. Ap- my apologies. I, well, my, the defense could have brought this in, and this, and the defense could have simply simply said, well. The state thinks that it's worth 15 years. Why and use this as a uh, as a yardstick for what Par might or might uh, might get or ought to get? And I think that would uh, that that would at least balance things out. Is the court going to allow this? I can't. Uh, probably so. I you know the the courts are real lenient in punishment in the punishment phase as to uh, what. What evidence that they bring in, and they allow, what they allow people to talk about. If this, um, the other alternative is that if the state had not actually put a hard figure and told Whiteside, "We're only going to give you 15 years," well, you know, in, in this case, if that were the case, then you, the defense, could argue that this is simply not fair. Whiteside knows ahead of time whether or not he's going to be given some kind of a plea deal. He knows ahead of time if his, if his, um, how good or how bad. The state also knows. The state has a pretty good idea of what what they are or are not going to do in a in a plea deal with Whiteside. It's just it's just simply not fair for a defense not to, uh, for a par not to know what um, what his co-defendant's looking at. Can you talk about a little bit about the law of parties and and how that interacts with co-defendants where there is crimes and a um, Jim's going to take back over crimes and a homicide. What? Let me explain something that probably should have been brought up on appeal. My only criticism of the lawyers, as a matter of fact, I'm taking the same issue up on another appeal. Both of these guys were initially charged with capital murder mm-hmm. because both of them were involved in a shooting in which one man was killed, and both are considered equally responsible. My argument has always been is that when they reduced one person's charge to robbery, that that is a concept called collateral estoppel. What it basically says, once there's been an adjudication of an ultimate issue, you can't relitigate it. Mm-hmm. My argument was, and it still would have been in this case, when they reduce the charge on white side to aggravated robbery, they should be collaterally stopped from trying par for murder because they have made an adjudication that this whole offense was, was an aggravated robbery. And I would have argued collateral estoppel. I would have argued that when they reduced the charge on white side, they couldn't then thereafter charge par with capital murder because under the law of parties, both are equally guilty for the crime. And if Whiteside is only guilty of aggravated robbery by taking his plea, that's an adjudication as an aggravated robbery, they should be barred from trying a death penalty case. This has not been litigated in capital murder cases yet. In fact, I'm taking it up with another lawyer. I'm helping on a case out of, in fact, out of Dell, out of San Antonio. We're taking this very issue up in which they had a series of people that were parties to a crime. All of them were equally guilty. The state cut deals with everybody else but the client that was convicted. Tried him for capital murder, the rest of them they tried for aggravated robbery, just like this case. Argument was then, it should have been in this particular case, that once the state reduced the co-defendant's charge to aggravated robbery, that's an adjudication of an ultimate issue, namely that this offense was an aggravated robbery and not a capital murder. And once they did that, they should be barred from trying par for capital murder. That argument was not made in this case, but it should have been. That's my only comment. Uh, but, did, as as you're, you're, you're like you say, this is kind of new field that's being played. Well, it's plowed never here. been litigated before. I've, mm-hmm. In fact, I'm taking it up for the first time on the very identical issue we're talking about here. Because when the state makes a decision that a case is an aggravated robbery, they should be barred from trying somebody else for a greater offense. Now, you're raising this on direct appeal or writ appeal? I mean, on direct appeal. It has to be raised on direct appeal. You can't very well raise it on collateral. It can be real difficult to raise on a collateral appeal, but I'm raising it on direct appeal because I'm saying that once they reduce it, that they are stopped, collaterally stopped. To stop means just you can't do yeah, it. Yeah, sure. And they are stopped from trying the co-defendant for a greater offense. Because by their own action, when the judge accepted the plea, 
and accepted a plea that was aggravated robbery. That's a judicial finding that the conduct in this case equals aggravated robbery. And that falls under the Zier's stare diseases. The court has well, decided it's a, on the really the cuddle stopples a bar to jeopardy. Okay. And what it basically says is once a court has adjudicated an ultimate issue in a case, they can't relitigate it. Well, when they reduce it to aggravated robbery, what is that? That's an adjudication by a judge that this is an aggravated robbery case. Can you do it the other way around? Go ahead and convict the guy of the homicide and then have an adjudication about uh, the 15 years No, because robbery. it only works for the defense, not the state. Ah. And so that's our argument. That's what I would, I would have done that on appeal. They didn't have much to work with on appeal. I read through all the appellate decisions. But at least they have that issue. It's never been litigated before. But you, I think it should be done in all of these cases where the state works out an agreement with a co-defendant who is equal into the law, is equal as guilt as a primary actor. If they reduce the charge, I think they should be barred from trying the other co-defendant for a greater charge. So in all these cases that are basically law parties cases, right? somebody gets off wide because it's let's make a deal. I'm the first one to get right. to the DA's office. And then somebody gets hammered pretty heavily. Right. Once they have made the determination on the lighter charge, it is your theory that, according to English common law traditions, I'm saying that once they do a lighter charge, that's a judicial decision that this case is an aggravated robbery and not a capital murder. It's an ultimate decision made by court. Yeah. That's my argument. And See then, what I'm saying? And then the, the collateral estoppel then kicks in at that point. That's what I would argue. And you have to unwind back to um, to the original. Well, this is... Uh, I tell you, juries can buy this better than lawyers. Let me give you an example. I've tried a bunch of cases in times past in which the state has made deals with defendants. I have yet to see a jury give a co-defendant that I've defended more time than the defendant who worked a deal and went for the state. Every case I've ever tried where they've cut a deal with the co-defendant, I've never had a jury assess greater punishment than they gave the co-defendant. Mm. Juries understand this. Juries got this. Well, yeah. think about it for a moment. Uh, both men are equally culpable under the law. Yeah. Both of them are guilty of capital murder. Yeah. Both of them are parties to it. Yeah. The fact that White's eye was a bad shot and yeah. Parr was a better shot does not excuse his conduct. Hmm. So why should he walk away with a 15-year sentence when he's equally as guilty as Parr? What about the jailhouse snitch? We haven't gone into that, but there was uh, somebody in the jail that oh, yeah. gave evidence in this case. What about that? What? We've this, unfortunately, we've had this happen over and over and over again in a lot of these cases. It seems like in North Texas, everybody in jail is a snitch. I don't know. Maybe it's a Dallas phenomenon. I don't know. In North Texas. Well, they, they, they do show up pretty regularly. I remember the documentary, uh, 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 The Thin Blue, Thin Blue Line. Blue Line with yeah, yeah, Adam, right. Randall Adams, yeah, sure. Yeah, Randall Adams' case. Uh, uh, jailhouse snitches and eyewitnesses, apparently, throw down eyewitnesses just abound. And don't forget the case out of, course, or Sacana on, on, what was the gentleman, remember on the arson case? That he oh, was you're, you're talking about the Willingham case. The Willingham case. Remember, there was a jailhouse snitch. Yeah. If you recall in that case, and this is the most bizarre thing in the world, a man who had never met Willingham claims he walked by his cell and Willingham confessed to him as he was walking by. They'd never talked before, and they'd let that man testify. And you see that so often. And the only thing you can do, in a, uh, again, when you have a jailhouse snitch like that, when you're the defense lawyer, what do you've got to do? Juries can pretty well understand that, and I don't think it's that effective. Uh, I don't know why prosecutors use it as much. Thankfully, at least in Harris County, we haven't had the rash of jailhouse snitches they've had up in North Texas. This we don't we don't manufacture them as readily. Not as readily. Right. In North Texas, if you recall, virtually all these snitch cases come out of Dallas and North Texas area. Yeah. In Fort Worth. In Fort Worth. Same difference. Susan wants to get in on well, this. Okay. The, the lasting impact of really uh, Whiteside's testimony, it's relevant on the issue of future dangerousness, okay? Mm -hmm. Because the motivation for the unadjudicated killing was that this person was going to testify against his friend. So the state didn't need Whiteside on guilt or innocence, but clearly Whiteside's testimony at punishment would have a big impact on the issue of future dangerousness. Well, who because made the determination that Whiteside was 
less futurist, future dangerous than. Well, that that would be up up to the the prosecutors have discretion as, and they clearly made a deal with Mr. Whiteside. Clearly. But, you know, what I would also add to that is your lasting picture is somebody who's completely embraced outlaw mentality, and Parr's street name was outlaw. And so the lasting impact of Whiteside's testimony and what came out at punishment was the mentality of someone who totally embraced outlaw. And that's, of course, hurt him on the issue of future dangerousness. <sighs> Carol Joe Parr is dead. Uh, you heard him in his very own words, and I know it was confusing. It was difficult to follow. I was sitting on the other side of the glass looking him in the eye, and it was difficult for me to follow. I don't know what to think about all of this, but I can tell you, as long as we continue killing people, we will continue to have blood on all of our hands. We do execution watch in the hopes that we can raise your sense of yours. Yes, you're, you're listening, so I'm talking to you. Raise your sensitivity on an issue that affects your life, affects your consciousness, affects your relationship with the world around you. And you're not even part of it. You're just receiving this information. But it was done in your name and in my name and in all of the lawyers we've had in the studio's name, everybody's name. We're all involved in this. We all hope there's a day when this will stop. And if we get into an era where the United States joins the rest of the civilized world, this will stop. Until then, we will come into the studios at KPFT, whether it be on HD2 channel, as it was tonight, or whether it's going to be in the broadcast studio where people on death row can actually hear it. And when we're invited, we will go to Huntsville and we will interview the person that is being executed. We've got another interview in the can. On the 21st, we'll be interviewing or we'll play a show if they don't stop it before. And that's of inmate Pruitt who's scheduled to be executed on those days. And that's a very different case. Unlike this case, as far as Pruitt was concerned, I made some sense out of what he had to say. And then... Our research has found out some other stuff. Every case is different. I want to thank uh, Dole for his uh, loyalty of coming in here and making the board work. Our producer is Elizabeth Stein, and Elizabeth Stein is the wizard that makes all this put together and even tries to make me sound like I know what I'm talking about. We couldn't do any of this without the wizardry of Otis McClay. Our lawyers tonight, was we had a full passel of them, uh, we had Susan Ashley, we had Jim Skelton, we had Larry Douglas, Michael Gillespie, and Jack Lee. Our interview was with Carol Joe Parr. Our reporters in Huntsville was Dennis Longmire, who was able to get um, David uh, in on the show. A reporter from The Vigil in Houston was Jennifer Simmons. My name is Ray Hill. I breathe. Carol Joe Parr does not. Thanks for listening to Execution Watch. Tell your friends. Support KPFT Houston. <laughs>